Good morning, all you fathers. Happy Father's Day. Happy Father's Day to all of you. Uh, so thankful to have this opportunity. Uh, a couple of things I want to say. I'm used to going on for a couple of hours or else the people don't think I like them. <laughs> and now I'm in a place where uh, if I go on beyond an hour, you won't like me. So <laughs> I'm going to try. <laughs> Uh, my, I'm going to try my very best to uh, walk us through this. Uh, so because of that, I, just this message blessed me so much. I really want to get through it, and I hope it blesses all of, you, all of us, not only the fathers, but, but the mothers and all the families and even the children. Uh, just listen to this good news that we have. Um, the passage we're going to be going into is Peter chapter 1. We're going to go through uh, verses 3 through 5. Um, this message of living hope and much, much, much more <clears throat> where, where Peter takes us. Uh, this is a message for the elect exiles here, uh, the churches of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. And uh, this, this message that Peter gives them, uh, I love it because often we feel disconnected to the Old Testament. We feel disconnected to the time of the apostles, the first century church. But this really makes it relevant to us. Uh, and, and that's the reason I, want, I felt led to go there, being here for uh, over a, a little bit over a year now, just seeing what's happening to us, uh, I really felt that this message that has echoed forward for centuries is a message for us today. Um, he uh, reminds them of what we have, where we've come from, and where we are, and where we're headed, all in this doxology, all in these three verses right here, uh, where he's pointing to the, the work of God, the work of Jesus Christ our Lord. And I just want to read it. He says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Uh, you know, coming home, seeing not only what's happening here, seeing what's going on even in different parts of the world, you can blame it on COVID. Maybe it's things that have gone on post-COVID. Uh, some people believe, like myself, it's been going on forever. Uh, it's just a different... Uh, way now that the world's being affected. Uh, the world is full of despair. Uh, there's, the, the world has put so much trust in medicine, and as it's let them down once, twice, three times, the world is despairing even more. Uh, the, the government is failing. Governments all over the world are letting people down, and they're in despair. And they're putting their hope in all these things. And the, the social construct, the way things are going socially, and the immorality, and everything that we see um, that just hurts to, to see, right? It's painful. Uh, even people in the world are having a hard time with some of the things that are going on. Um, and so this, this is our reality, the cost of life, living expenses, everything. I'm just thinking of all you younger men and women. And, I'm, and I've talked to some of you of, of how it just does not seem hopeful for you. Um, so the depression, divorce, suicide, all these things are the norm now. And so I just feel it's time we go back. Uh, we go back and, and, and think about these things because these guys, it was much more intense than what we're going through. Think about that. The, these guys... They were suffering much more. 
Maybe that's the writing on the wall. Maybe that's what's coming. So let us be equipped as they were equipped by the preaching of Paul and the encouragement of, of the word of God, right? And so things, things were very intense for them, historically persecuted uh, from all men, everywhere they went. Uh, they, their, their suffering was escalating uh, under Nero. Uh, the, the, these were beyond challenging times. And he was preparing their hearts with the message. Uh, and they were, they were encouraged and called by this blessing right here, this moment of worship that we just read, talking about the great mercy, the, the, the being born again to a living hope that he caused through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the finished work of Jesus. And then he keeps going on with this worship about this inheritance that is theirs kept in heaven. It's not here, guys. It's in heaven. And then he says, by God's power, you're being guarded through faith. So just get that. He was, he was, he was calling them, and I believe to this, uh, it's kind of a long title, but it's my title. It, he's calling them to hopeful conduct in victorious sufferings. There's a hopeful conduct in these victorious sufferings. I know we're suffering. Different degrees, everybody. But you're victorious. And there's hope. And so that's the message that I believe he's bringing here to the, to the people here. And he's reminding them, going back and referencing the Old Testament, we're going to go there. And then he's, it's, it's echoing forward to us. Why? Because this is truth, and it, it's living in the abiding word of God, and there's no stopping it, and it's going to echo forward from us. And what are they going to hear? Unbelief or belief? What's, what are they going to hear? What are they going to remember? Uh, Father's Day, as fathers and, and mothers and young children in Christ. So with that, uh, let me just pray. Father God, it is always a time of hope, God. Always. Lord, just as you suffered, just as you came in as the lamb, Lord, and you rose again as the lion, God, and you sit on the throne now, and you're in control of all things, God. These are your subsequent glories, Lord. Father, help us to see this and to know it, God. Help me, God, right now, just forget myself, Lord, that you would be made known as we just sung beautiful singing of the saints. Oh, God, fill me with your spirit right now, that the peace of Jesus Christ would rule over my heart right now. Help me to speak clearly, God. Help me to be comforted by the comforter because you are God. Lord. And teach us all, God, your word right now this day, Lord. Help us to understand what it is that we're called to believe, God, to put our hope in today. God. And pass this on to all men, God, our children and beyond. I pray this in the name that is above all names, in the name of our Savior, our Lord, our God, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> So, real quick, I, I want, I, I'm going to need to do a little overview to understand the trials that the, the churches were suffering, right? The things that these saints were facing. Uh, he says there that in this you rejoice, although now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. So we want to, under, we want to understand what are some of these trials. We want to Look in there uh, and understand their context, the audience, what was going on with them. And to do that, I think it's not going to take long, but we just need to hit a few things. He, he's, he's going into relationships that they're involved in. And you see it right here. He's, he brings up the living stone that was rejected by men in chapter 2, our Lord Jesus Christ. Men, meaning men, all men, everywhere we are, we're going to be rejected. That's, the, that's a trial. 
It's coming to us. Why is it coming to us? Well, because you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up on this. If he's rejected, you will be rejected. And he's making that clear. And then he goes on to talk about government, right, politics. And he goes on to talk about how we're to be subject to the authorities. And this is so hard for so many. Uh, It affects so many things. And I know it's a sensitive issue. But I'm going to go there, and, you can, and we can talk about it later. And, and, but I want to see what the Word of God teaches us. He, he's, he's, he's teaching us that even through that, we're getting rejected. We're getting persecuted. And then he goes on. And he starts talking about the workplace uh, or masters and servants and starts talking about even if some are not good or, or, or gentle or even unjust, even unjust, right? Even if we're treated unjustly, here's what he says. He says, for what credit is it if when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? Verse 21. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Let me back up. For this is a gracious thing. Verse 19. When mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. It's all about being mindful of God. This is what he's getting at in these relationships with who? With men, with the world, with the the government, with the workplace. Then he goes on and he starts coming in deeper and he hits the marriage. And he says right here to to the wives, uh, He says to the wives, for example, wives, be subject to your own husbands, so that even if some do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives. And then husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way. Honor them. Honor them. So he's, he's... What's going on here, really, the way I, I, as I was studying, I was thinking this through, thinking, wow, it's like this huge target. And the outside ring is man, the whole, like, world, the communities, everything around you. And then it gets closer, right? And then it's, it's hitting these, the, 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 the work, the authorities, the politics, all that ring right there. And then that's coming after us, and then it's the workplace, and then sometimes, even in the home, in our marriage, it's going to happen. And, but all of that, he says this in, in 9. Where's the bullseye on this target? He says, finally, all of you have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love. He's talking to the churches now. You're the target. All this is getting hit by all the fiery darts of the wicked one to get you and destroy this unity. Get that. That's so clear right here. And then he, you know, this reminds me of of Ephesians 6. But we, we have the faith. We have the shield of faith that does what? Quenches all the fiery darts of the wicked one. It's an absolute truth that that is what's going to happen in faith. Trusting in God. And so that's what he's getting at here. You know, these these events that are going on outside, these things happening in our world, they affect that inner circle. Um, And so because of that, I feel like he began to move into our conduct. Where do we go from there? What do we do with these things? And Built on that foundation of what we read, that doxology, these truths in Jesus Christ, now he hits conduct, and he hits it five times. And he's, talk, he's, he's letting them know what he wants them to look to, right? He says right here in verse 13, therefore, preparing your minds for action. There's something to be ready for action right now, guys, and always, because of who he is, not because of who we are. And it's not the action you're thinking of. He he begins to lay out what that looks like. Um, So this conduct uh, that he highlights, uh, it's, it's an understanding that yet we don't bow down to evil men. We don't bow down to, to governments. We don't bow down to workplaces. We don't, 
We don't bow down to these things and go their way, right? Yet we address them and we make our appeals as however the Lord allows us to, how? With gentleness and respect. That's what he's going to teach us. That's what it's about. From the outside ring all the way to the center ring, that's all we have to end with one another even. Always. That's what he's teaching us right here. Uh, and so you, what that is, is it's a trusting, it's a thanksgiving, it's thankfulness for everything, every trial that comes because he's in it and you believe it and he's your only hope. And so that's, what's, that's, that's what I want to draw out. Let's go through them real quick. He says, you know, I'll just read them out loud. He says, be holy. He says, you also be holy in all your conduct as God is holy, right? He then says, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile. It's conduct again. He says, keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable so that when they speak evil of you or against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of his visitation. He's, he's hitting this. He goes, and then again with the, with, with, with the wives, we just read it. C conduct yourself in this way. Win them without a word. And then he says, when, you, when, they, when they see your respectful and pure conduct, you hearing that? Over and over, he's hitting our conduct because of what it's built on. That's what obedience looks like. That's why we're called obedient children in chapter 1, 14. As obedient children, do not be conformed, right, to the passions of your former ignorance. We're not ignorant of the schemes of the devil, of the enemy. We're not ignorant to these things. And so he, he keeps going on um, sh showing us that That is our drive. That is our, the, the wind. That is everything, is this mercy that you've received. Think about that. It's, he's, he calls it a great mercy in the prayer, right? According to his great mercy. Like, just start there. We've received mercy and we're not going to be merciful? What do we have that has not been given to us? We're not going to see these things and know they're real, and we're not going to look to that hope, and we're not going to show mercy to this world the same way we've been showing mercy. You see, because that's the fruit of this prayer in this, in this world. Uh, and that's what I kind of want to draw out. You know, these... Uh, this, this is why we cannot forget. These exiles were chosen uh, for, right here, First Peter, for, uh, yes, the glory that is to be theirs, and yet, yes, the suffering that they were going to live through. It's both. Uh, it's both. And verse 21 in chapter 2 says, For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. The righteous one, the perfect one, our Lord. And this is what we look to. Uh, you know, moving on with this, it, it, as you read these letters, as you read through the word of God, I love it. It's so, f you gotta read it over and over again because there's so much. And something that stuck out to me this time, what, whether these were Jews, there's a talk about that, debate on that. Were they Jews or were they G Gentiles because of these areas? It does say the dispersion, so it could have been. It, I kind of follow that it was both. It may have been both. Um, and regardless, I really believe, uh, just like when I go anywhere in the world and I talk about Christianity, everybody knows our story. Everybody knows about Christianity. Um, and in the same way, I believe even the Gentiles may have known and understood the redemptive story 
of, of Israel. Uh, so that being said, I feel like Peter is, is now uh, going to walk them through uh, with, 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 uh, with an understanding of trying to help them look back to that redemptive story. Uh, and I'm, I'm going to try to prove this to you. Uh, Peter, he's been known for teaching with vivid imagery. That's what he does. Uh, he's been known to, to teach with figurative speech. He's wanting to get us to go somewhere. Uh, for example, he says, uh, he says uh, in Christ, the, the sprinkling of the blood, right there in chapter 1. He says, uh, it, this precious blood of Jesus Christ... He, this, like, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot, right? And so he's, he's drawing you somewhere. He calls them elect exiles twice, and then he calls them sojourners and exiles. And he's, it's, it's taking you somewhere, and I believe it was taking them somewhere. When he says the word inheritance in the prayer, what inheritance would have popped in their mind after they've been freed, Right? After they've been wandering like a nation, sorry, like a people without a nation, uh, what would they have been thinking? Perhaps the promised land, this inheritance that was to come. Um, And the one that hit me powerfully for the first time, he says right there in verse 8, though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him. And rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory. Um, That just reminds me of when Moses left the people. And they said, this Moses left us. We don't even know when he's coming back. Make for us gods that will go before us. Like This is going to all tie in, guys. It all ties in. He even says, and he quotes Leviticus 11, when he says, you be holy as I am holy. He, it, when you go back and you read that reference, they, it was to not eat these things, to be, un, right, to be clean, and to stay away from testable, testable foods, and, and, and stay away from certain things, and be holy as he, and he is holy. He says, for I am your God that saved you, that took you out of Egypt. I'm that God. And so he's taken me back to the wilderness, and I hope that's where he's taken you, just with some of what's going on here. And he's taken them back to the, to the wilderness. Now, why would he do that? Was my question. What's going on here? Why is he addressing them with that? This is why, because it's all of the counsel of God is for our instruction. All of it. We always go back to the ancient ways. Always go back to what God's teaching us. Because he's the same God then as he is now. And he's the God that's reigning. And will return. And so that's why it's the, it's the big picture of who he is. And so there's examples there that we need to look to. There, it's, it's relevant, again, to us. We cannot forget those teachings. Uh, even Paul, Romans Romans um, 15, verse 4. We're on the topic of, uh, of hope. Uh, here's what Romans 15, verse 4 says. I'll, I'll read it for you. For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction that through endurance and through encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. We might have hope. He's leading them to hope. So that's what we're doing here. And then Paul 1 Corinthians, chapter, chapter 10. He's, this is where he's warning them of something, and, and we're going there right now, guys. He's warning them of idolatry, and he's teaching them. And he says there in verse 7, do not be idolaters as some of them were. The people sat down to eat and to drink and rose up to play. So back to Exodus 32, right? Back to that Reference back to that passage. Look what he says down here in the bottom. He says in verse 9, we, we must not put Christ to the test as some of them did when, when they were destroyed by the serpent, nor grumble 
as some of them did and were destroyed by the destroyer. So now here we are. We're back there. We're seeing it. We're studying it. We're familiar with it. If you're not, get more familiar with it. And it's giving us instruction. And here, Paul's teaching Gentiles, by the way. And what's he teaching them? The Old Testament. Everyone's going back to know where they're at in Christ, to understand it fully in light of the gospel. And so here Paul uh, encourages us to do the very same thing. Um, What happened in Exodus uh, 32? I'll just summarize it for time's sake. Uh, The people, they they were set free by the blood of the lamb, right? They were set free. The people, they uh, were taken uh, by their mediator, and they were headed towards the promise, towards the inheritance. Uh, their, their mediator, like I already said, he delayed. He delayed. He, was, he didn't come back. And yes, the people did say, at that moment, make gods for us that will go before us. That statement is hope. Who goes before us? Jesus Christ, our Lord. Who's with us to the end? He who will never leave us or forsake us. Who gives us boldness? Who makes us courageous? It's Jesus Christ. He goes before us. And these guys, they they miss that. They forgot what they had been freed from. And if we forget what we've been freed from, we forget this finished work of the resurrection, we too will be lost. And look what they did. They, they made this golden calf and they put their hope in it. They praised it, sacrificed to it. And then here's the terrifying part for me. Then they made a feast and they declared it a feast to Yahweh. It wasn't Yahweh alone anymore. So how did they get there? That was my question. How does that happen? How do we fall into that trap? How do we get hit with that arrow? You know, there's a, something I just have to say. If we forget who our Savior is and that he alone is our hope, We will place our hope in other things just like them. You will. We will. We all will. Whether family, marriages, relationships, having friends, being cool, uh, everything. Intelligence, authorities, security, prosperity, medicine, everything. Even ministry. They're all golden calves, man. All of it. So what was their conduct? Because that's what he's hitting. What, what did they do? How did they arrive to that idolatry? That's, that's what I want to know. Uh, I read something in Psalms uh, 106, if you want to go there. <clears throat> Psalms 106. And he says uh, in verse 19, they made a calf in Horeb and worshiped a metal image. They exchanged the glory of God for the image of an ox that eats grass. And here it is. They forgot their savior. That's what happens. That's the sin. Then you go down a little bit more, and I think there's something that gives us more understanding of what's going on in their conduct. Verse 24, they despised the pleasant land. They were not looking to it anymore. Having no faith in his promise. See, when you put your hope on something else, You're having no faith in what's promised already. Having no faith in the promise. And here's what they did. Here's a red flag. They murmured in their tents and did not obey the voice of the Lord. So there's a connection there with the conduct. Something's going on. We're seeing how this is happening. 
It's coming in from the outside. It's affecting them. They're forgetting who God is. They're forgetting their mediator. They're now looking around and wanting to fashion an image. Give me something to put my hope on. Give me anything that I can hold on to that will go before me. I've been there. We've all been there. And then that comes with something. Right here, he gives us some insight. He says they murmured. There's a complaining that starts in us, right? It happens. In every subject, in every relationship we just brought up, it is present. And here God's warning us in his word. In fact, Peter, I believe, hints to it. Chapter 2, verse 1. So put away all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and slander. Huh? Put it away. Then he goes on right here, and, he, and he's talking about, I already went through it, being treated unjustly. What do you do? You keep your mind on God. You're mindful of God. And then he, talks, he says, says to the ladies, even if some of your husbands do not obey the word, that they may be one without a word. What? That's impossible. By the conduct of their wives, when they see your respectful and pure conduct, a gentle and quiet spirit, a little background if you don't know me or my testimony, that's how I got saved. See, I got to experience that come to life for me. That quiet and gentle spirit. No more murmuring, complaining, disputing. It it broke me. I wanted to know what this hope that she had was, right? That's what he says. He says, for this is how the holy women hoped, who hoped in God, used to adorn themselves. There's an adorning that we have to have in our conduct. And it saves people. That's my testimony. That's my testimony. That's what I have been given. Um, You know, I just want to remind us again We're looking back to the Old Testament, but we have a much greater mediator. Amen? Like what we have is a a greater grace. We have the resurrected Lord who intercedes on our behalf. We have a greater grace. We have a greater sacrifice than that of a lamb. We, We have a a greater inheritance that's ours. It's to come. We have a greater salvation than bondage from Egypt. We've been freed from all of our sins. That's what this whole prayer is. He's calling them to understand what they have. So why? So that then they can put on. Put it on. Put on the armor of God. Put on Jesus Christ. That's what he's doing here. You know, these, these days, sometimes we just want it now. Give it to me now, you know. Uh, and so I just want to rem- remind us, no, right now, here we are. We are in our exile. We're not lost, but we're in our exile. We're found and we're headed somewhere by, by the grace of God in Christ, our mediator. But right now, this is where we are. Uh, And we ought to have a hopeful conduct in our victorious sufferings because of what we have. Um, These these elect exiles, guys, they echo faith to us. We're not even close to where they were at. Uh, If you know the story, They suffered unto death, dipped in oil, lit on fire for miles on the roads to light up 
the streets. And that death, so you know, saved many. They suffered to the point of death. And now here we are giving glory to their God, who is our God, because of this testimony. That ought to floor you. He was them being Christ-like. So in the same way, this ought to echo to us, and we ought to understand this. So these men, we, we observe their conduct. Uh, we learn from them historically how they actually dealt with the world, the nation, uh, their marriages, their church. Um, you know, they, they put this hope on display. That even though they were lit up on fire, and he told them in Ephesians, or in in chapter 4, in Peter, he tells them, don't, be, don't think this thing strange when the fiery trial comes upon you. You know what they did, though? They lit up the darkness. They literally lit up the darkness. And that's what we're called to do. Uh, that, that, that is what we're called to do in the very same way. When all of the world grumbles, guys, and all the world is disputing, and nobody has any hope. They need to see us lit up. That's what they need. They need to see Jesus Christ in us. First for us, right? To behold his glory, to behold his majesty, to trust him in the midst of the suffering, but then that they might see his glory. That, the, that there is hope. There is salvation. It's not about this place. And when they see you and you're not disputing, when you should be, you're, you're not getting into uh, slander, um, but you're doing something else and they're watching you. Uh, it's interesting, in chapter three of Peter, he quotes the Psalms, chapter 34. And I'll just read it to you. You don't have to go there. He says, let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. He's, he's instructing them with this. And he says, for the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their prayers. Church, that's us. We, the world's going to watch us go to God, not to slander, not to grumbling, not to disputing. Go to God. And they're going to see this hope in you. They're, they're not going to understand it. Go to chapter 3, verse 14. But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled. Why? But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy. When they ask you, always being prepared to make a defense and apologetic to anyone who asks you for the reason, for the hope that is in you. There it is. There, there it is. That's, that's what he's pointing to. And it, this is relevant to us, is it not? This, this means something to us from the inside out. And that's how you're going to have these. Everyone always says, how do I have these moments? Here it is. How am I going to share the love of Christ? Here it is. How, how am I going to have these moments where I can walk somebody through the word of God? Here it is. Here's one way. And it's, make, it's being made clear to us right here in Scripture. You will not grumble. You will not complain like everyone else. That, that is not light. Well, what if I'm being treated unjust? We just read that. That's, that's victorious suffering. 
If these things were not happening, we wouldn't be praying for them, perhaps. But it's when they, they come at us, we begin to pray and make our requests known to God. We start asking God to bless them and to use us in their lives. And then when that moment comes and they ask you, why aren't you grumbling? You tell them what this hope is. We preach it to our children. We, treat, we preach it to our spouses, to our government. Huh? We preach it to our churches. We preach it to everyone. So keep, keep this in mind. Um, that is what we're looking to. That is what we're hoping for. And it is made known to them. Yeah. Go to Philippians chapter 2. <clears throat> if you're tracking with me, you're probably already at the right, chap at the right passage. <clears throat> Verse 14. Do all things without grumbling or disputing, <laughs> that you may be blameless and innocent children of God, without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. That's it. That's what it's about. This is how you shine right now before men. You know, we, we, uh, Sometimes I have a hard time applying this, and so my heart, my hope, is that you get this hope so, so it's applicable to your soul. And honestly, even more than that, and that you're useful for the master. I want him to be praised. Because I wouldn't even be able to encourage you if it were not for him. What, what good could I give you except him? So, this inheritance, it's not here. It's, it's the already and not yet. And that's why that living hope, we live it out. Go to Ephesians chapter 1. Verse 11, he says, In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. All things, all men, all governments, all workplaces, all marriages, all churches, to the counsel of his will. He's working, believe it. He has not left us or forsaken us, all things, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ, there's our hope again, might be to the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation and believed in him, you were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the down payment, the guarantee of what? Of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it. But it's ours, man. Like, and to the praise of his glory, it's ours. Like, you, you, you have to follow this. This was the message he was giving these people in their exile. This is the message for us in our exile. You do not belong here. You're citizens of a holy nation, right? You're citizens of uh, the celestial city. You're, you're not citizens of this place. You, you've been set apart. You've been the, you're the chosen elect. And part of that election includes suffering gloriously, victoriously, because it's according to his will, if that's to come. Uh, so, I, 
I sometimes come off a little strong. Uh, and I know that. And I, I don't want us to be condemned. This is my, my last point. I don't want us to be condemned. Uh, I'm like well, very passionate, obviously. Uh, my, my background, uh, the feudal ways of my forefathers was you trash talk. You grumble, you dispute, and if you have to, be a brawler. That's my background. Uh, I'm the chief of all disputers. Like, if, if, if this is made known to me, this has to be made known to you. That's kind of how I feel. Hey, uh, I'm, 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 not, I'm not trying to explain this without my life, without my experience. I want you to understand how I felt when this hit me. Defeated. Oh, no, Lord. But this confession, uh, and this confession set me free. And then going back to this doxology, this moment of worship of who he is, thinking of his mercy and his payment and his resurrection and this inheritance, this salvation, it just, it's too much. And you're guarding my faith, Lord. This doesn't depend on me. So don't be condemned. Just listen, repent, praise God. And so don't be, and then think of the man he chose. This was not on accident. The, the guy I relate to the most is this guy who was an uneducated man uh, who doubted, who when the Lord told him, I'm going to go and be crucified, he said, no, you're not. And God had to rebuke him. This, this is the man God chose. He was the man that was ready to take anything on and do what? Lord, take over here now. I want this. I want to do this, Lord. Let's do it kind of attitude. I relate to that. He's, he's my man. I get him. You know, this is the guy God used. And then he humbled him. And then the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit in Peter is made known to us right here in this book. What God does with the broken man with humility. And then he had that glorious talk post-resurrection, do you love me? You know I love you. Go, go feed my sheep. Go tend to my sheep. He was useful. And this blows me away. This is the guy that just fed us right now through the living and abiding word of God. Like, wow, don't be condemned. Let's just follow the teachings of the apostles Let's follow the teachings as the way they did it, the way they delivered it to their audience, the way they took them back to the beginning, the way that we can see the whole counsel of God according to his will. Let's follow that. Let's obey. And then let's teach it in the same way. Not only a word, but in deed. So, for Father's Day, uh, it's not hard to tie this in. The only inheritance we have to pass down that's worthy is this one. We don't have to worry about any other inheritance. This is the one you've been entrusted with to pass down to your babies. You, you show them how you defend this truth because it is holy. You shut down every other thought out there. That's the kind of father you're going to be. And you lead them to this rock in the middle of suffering because they're going to suffer. You, that's the kind of fathers we are. That's what we ought to be doing. And we keep doing that by putting this hopeful conduct in victorious suffering on display. It's not only talk. Amen? It's not only talk. And that's what he's doing right here. That's what he's encouraging us in because of who Jesus Christ is. And not only, I'll, I'll add this and I'm done. Not only to our children, but to the young men that God has put in front of you, older men. Be, be fathers to them. Use any opportunity. Make opportunities. Lead them. Beginning in the church. And then get them outside and snatch them. 
Give them Jesus Christ. Give them this hope. There are many hopeless, and you can be fathers to them, bringing them to who? To the blessed Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness, God. Thank you, Lord, how this word truly is living and abiding, God. It is eternal, Lord. It is what we live for. It is what we die for, God. You alone have the words of eternal life, God. So help us to live it, God. Help, it, help us to put these pages on the streets. Help us to put these words in the air, God. Help us to live this out, Lord, in our homes and abroad, God, to the glory of your name, Lord. I thank you for your grace, Lord, for your mercy. Uh, and I thank you for this beautiful day, God. I do ask that you would bless all the fathers, God that this message right here, Lord, would be permanent in their hearts and that there would be a transformative power that takes over, Lord. And that you would save our children, God, even on this Father's Day, Lord. Save them, Lord. I pray this in the name of my Savior, my Lord, my God, Jesus Christ. Amen.